Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of SBJ Live. I'm Dan Kaufman with Sports Business Journal. Thank you for being here. I will go through a few logistics, as I always do, as people are coming in here, um, and then we'll get right to our panel. But these two logistical points that I make on every episode are important because they're the way that we maximize the experience for you all, the, the listeners out there. Here's the first one. The first one is you will see a chat bubble on the right hand side. That's where you can introduce yourself. We encourage you to do that. So in the chat bubble, say who you are, where you're coming from, what you're doing, what you want to get out of this. And if you see people in that chat bubble messaging and you know them or you want to say hello to them, feel free to do that. We encourage that type of engagement during these sessions. Number two is there's a questions bubble right next to the chat bubble. That's where we want your questions. Chris is going to weave those questions in throughout this conversation. Don't wait till the end. There's no specific Q&A period at the end. We take the questions throughout. You can upvote questions that you like to see in that chat bubble and that you want us to get to. So please do that. Questions in chat, interact with us, have a good time, enjoy and learn, and we'll all have a good time. So I appreciate you very much being here. I am going to turn it over shortly to our, our panelists. This is Sweat Equity, a case study in investing and entrepreneurship with Dave and Nate Checkets. Dave Checkets is managing partner of Checkets Partners Investment Management, and Nate, his son, is co-founder and CEO of Roan. And our moderator is Chris Smith. He is a reporter for Sports Business Journal. Thank you all. Enjoy. Great. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate the intro. And uh, Dave, Nate, great to see you guys. Thank you for joining us this morning. How are we doing? Doing well, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, excited to be here. This is fun. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. So, you know, as, as our readers will know, we just had a, a big cover story on Roan, sort of the, the growth of the company uh, over the last decade or so, uh, and a lot of what you guys have been doing lately. Uh, and, you know, specifically with Dave coming in um, and helping to lead a, a big new investment round uh, about a year ago. Uh, before we get to that, I think it's, as always, best to start these stories from the beginning. So, Nate, I'm going to hand it to you first. I want you to take us back about a decade, right? You, your brother Ben, some of the co-founders get together. You decide you're going to start a men's uh, athletic wear uh, clothing line, Roan. Why? How? What were you thinking? What was the opportunity? Can you take us through maybe a bit of the, the genesis of this brand that a lot of people, I think, you know, on this call will be familiar with uh, and, and you know, the opportunity you saw in the marketplace to launch something like that? Yeah, sure. So, I, I mean, I think it's important to mention I was always entrepreneurial growing up. I didn't know that, you know, that was really the term for it. But I, my dad would say I was always hawking something. You know, when we were uh, young, we had lemonade stands. We would go and visit my grandparents. We would set up uh, a stand where we would sell lemonade. Then we'd dive in the lakes and fish out the golf balls and sell them back to the golfers. Uh, when I was 14 or 15, my parents said, hey, you know, if, uh, we want you to learn how to pay for uh, some of your events coming up, you know, sports camps and other things. So what are you going to do to generate some summer income? We started a sports camp in my parents' backyard. And, uh, and then when I was in college, I entered a business plan competition for a, uh, a, a SMS-based messaging platform that became a point of sale platform inside stadiums and arenas. So I had always kind of had this entrepreneurial bug, uh, didn't really know what a traditional career path would be. And um, I, I, I took a couple of different turns on that career path, but ultimately I found myself um, one holiday period with my brothers and my mom had given us all a pair of Lululemon sweatpants for Christmas. And uh, we were talking about it. My brother-in-law, Karis, said, you know, I refuse to wear this brand. This is a women's yoga brand. And I said, what is the big deal? You know, this is, you know, the, the clothing's nice. And at the time, after selling the uh, startup to the, um, to the 49ers that I had led before, I had found myself at the NFL. And we were in the NFL offices a couple months later. And um, similarly, we had an event coming up and Budweiser was the key partner on the event. They sent a box to the office and in the, for the women, they gave them uh, Lululemon gear. And for the men, they gave them Nike gear. And it was just kind of this natural question. So I was like, hey, Lululemon makes men's product and Nike make, clearly makes women's product. Why, you know, why do they do this? And um, a very close friend of mine who I worked with at the NFL said to me, well, Nate, do you buy your underwear at Victoria's Secret? So it 
was just a question mark in my mind. Why are some brands men's brands and some brands, you know, more oriented towards women? There had some, there had been some brands who had done it really well and navigated that line, but it felt like when you mapped out the different uh, brands and I had access to all of this data in terms of gender mix and revenue figures, uh, there were two big pockets of active brands specifically. The first was kind of the core mass distributed uh, brands that we know, Nike, Under Armour, Reebok, Adidas. They were plus or minus 5% of each other in terms of gender mix, and they were very similar in terms of price point. But then you had the second pocket of brands that had emerged over the prior decade that were female uh, focused, predominantly focused on yoga, and they were at a 40% pre premium to the Nikes of the world, and less than 15% of their revenue was derived from men. So the question naturally came, why isn't there a men's focused brand that is at the premium end of the market with direct distribution to the consumer and is focused on kind of this next generation of, of clothing? And, uh, and so we started generating the idea. We knew nothing about apparel, fashion, e-com, but we started to see if we could develop the product. We did a lot of testing in those early days, and that's how Roan was started. And, and quick question, the Roan name, where, uh, where did that come from? So the Roan uh, name comes from the Rhone Valley and the Rhone Glacier, which starts in Switzerland and runs down the eastern corridor of France. We loved the idea of uh, naming ourselves after a river. We thought that was a powerful uh, symbol of progress and momentum. And um, I had spent some time over in that area, and it's a beautiful area. It's aesthetic. It's, uh, it was a functional trade route. And we liked the idea of marrying aesthetic and function um, in a brand name. And then, of course, what was really important is we could also get the domain names and the social handles. And so in those early days, before it, it was just called Nuco uh, for like the first three months, then we, you know, we realized that was an important aspect of picking a name. Got it. So I know you guys formally launched then September 2014. Um, right. Start doing a lot of, you know, directed consumer work and Dave, you know, would love to get your perspectives or, or what your perspectives were um, at the time. I mean, I mean, you are a man in the industry who needs no introduction, right? Someone who is, you know, owned and led teams, uh, major companies like Madison Square Garden and Legends, um, you know, someone who kind of knows sports businesses through and through. And as you shared with me, you didn't necessarily see a bright future for Roan in, in the early days, right? You didn't you know, necessarily understand what they were after. Well, I thought it was a tall order, Chris. And by the way, thanks for having us and, and uh, for the story that you did as well. Um, I, I, was, I was doubtful. I mean, I just said, look, you, you guys are taking on some companies that are really so strong, so big and so popular. Isn't there, a, isn't there an industry that you can find that, that doesn't have those kind of competitors? My role though, with Nate particularly, and really all of my kids has been to try to give them the wings to fly as they grew up. And what Nate did not mention when he talked about his ultra successful sports camp in our backyard, he didn't know it, but on that day, I took out an umbrella liability policy as he was dragging in, you know, 20 or 40 kids between the ages of four and seven to go swimming and play soccer and play dodgeball and basketball. So I have the same role here. I, I, but, but when he first started, Chris, I was saying, are you sure about this? Are you, uh, is this the industry you're choosing? So yeah, I know I might, just, sorry, go ahead, Nate. I might just I might just add, I distinctly remember as we were getting started, you know, it was like, I'm not sure this is a good idea. You know, he 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 would never tell us not to do something, but he would, you know, he's very persuasive. So he would try and persuade us not to do something. And in fairness to him, the other aspect of when we were getting off the ground, uh, the two weeks before we launched the site two big things happened. One, I'm type one diabetic and I had a severe case of um, uh, hypoglycemia, meaning a low blood sugar in the middle of the night and woke up in the hospital, partially because I had stayed up late trying to work on the site after you know catching a 6 a.m. train, getting back late at night. It was the only time I could find to, to work on the site in between everything else going on. 
And the second thing that happened in those two weeks leading up to the launch is my brother-in-law, Karis, who's a co-founder, his kitchen and house caught on fire. Um, and uh, they, he and his family ended up moving in with my parents for, uh, for a period of time while they resolved that. So it was, it was this council of, do you guys really need to take on one more thing in addition to having day jobs? And, uh, and it did, it gave us pause. It made us reflect and try and think through whether or not we were up to the task. And I know, Nate, to follow up on that, you also didn't ask, you know, you guys raised, what, about a million dollars in angel funding in the early days, and you didn't ask your family for money uh, as part of that, right, for that kind of very reason? Yeah, I think it was, uh, I think it was a combination of things. You know, when, when we got started, um, we just went out to friends and we said, hey, give us as much money as your spouse or partner won't be mad if you lose, because you'll probably lose it. We really don't know whether or not this is going to be successful. Um, I distinctly remember, uh, my, my dad's sister, my aunt wanting to give me a portion of her life savings to invest in the company. And I, I just didn't have the heart to say yes, because I was nervous beyond all imagination that we were going to lose it. And that, you know, that, so we wanted to get some momentum in those early days and, uh, and before we would ever consider taking family capital, that is the ultimate pressure cooker. Yeah, I can bet. Um, so I want to jump ahead a little bit in the story, right? So I know, turns out you guys struck gold, right? You succeeded, couldn't keep up with the orders you're getting. Um, you know, you raised a Series A in 2015, so that's $5 million, investors including uh, Steve Bornstein, David Stern, Shane Battier, some of the big names in the industry. Uh, but I want you to take us to sort of late 2016, because I think this is, you know, kind of the key inflection moment and a big part of the conversation we're going to have today kind of centers around uh, a deal that grows out of one of the offers you get. So in, in late 2016, you get two offers, right? One from the Gap to buy the company and two, one, an investment offer from Al Caterton, right? I think probably the biggest consumer product uh, private equity company out there. Take us through a bit of, you know, how those land on the table, right? What you're thinking, what they mean to you, and I guess how you're thinking about going through that decision-making process and figuring out, you know, which branch uh, or which road you want to take here, right, at this fork in the road. Yeah, well, we hadn't told or shared this story publicly really until this story. So it's, it's a fun one to share. Um, but, you know, the brand formally had been around for, for just over two years, informally for probably three. And... Uh, we get a call from the CFO of Athleta saying, hey, the Gap really wants to have a conversation with you. We may be interested as an investor. So we were flown out to their offices, spent some time with the management team of both Athleta and the Gap. Um, they could not have been uh, more accommodating and kind. And what they said is, look, we've done a tremendous amount of research in looking at the landscape uh, Athleta was a company that had, was started in Petaluma, California, um, just north of, uh, of, of where the Gap was based. And they acquired it and the brand was on fire. I think at the time they had um, 150 doors and, uh, and they were looking for a men's partner to go alongside it. It didn't feel like it was the exact right partnership, but more than anything, I was terrified about the fact that they had said, we've looked, we've looked at the landscape. We think you're the best brand out there and um, we want to partner with you. And then right before we left the Gap's offices, um, I was brought in uh, by the global CEO at the time. His name was Art Peck. And he said, you know, somewhat respectfully, but, um, but also clearly, Nate, you know, if, if you don't take our offer, I just want you to understand we will go out and we will create our own brand and we have a platform and we've got all the process to be able to compete very significantly with you. And so I left that meeting highly concerned uh, that either we were selling to them or we were going to inadvertently create our biggest competitor. And, uh, and a week later, we got a term sheet from Al Catterton, uh, the largest global consumer private equity fund. And, uh, we wrestled with it. We, you know, it was, it was something that we wrestled and spent time with. Ultimately we went with Al Catterton predominantly because we really liked the partner who was leading the deal. We liked the idea of controlling our own destiny. And, um, and then two years later, the gap launched a brand called Hill city, which, uh, and they went on a massive press tour with it. Uh, I was terrified that we were going to really get crushed in the marketplace, but, 
the brand ended up only living for about two years and then they ended up closing it down. The, a lot of the model shots and the, even the product names were very similar to ours. Um, but, you know, I think what was great is we had built a loyal and committed audience and they, you know, continued to buy and support us uh, through that. So that was kind of the story of how we got our initial capital raise off the ground. Okay. And now, Dave, I'm curious to know, I know that this is before you had gone to London, right, to lead the, the mission. Um, you know, at, at this point, you had, had you begun coming around on, on Roan? Um, oh, yeah. And also, and you obviously have, a, you know, a tremendous background in investing, right? And so I'm curious, you know, what, what counsel you were giving at this point in time, uh, and your thoughts on Roan bringing in Al Catterton as a, a major significant investor? Well, good question, Chris. I've never been an early stage investor. Very few startups uh, that I've gone into, but I have done a lot of growth stage businesses. I did one one startup called JetBlue Airlines uh, clear back in 2000. I invested in, and joined the board and that was grueling to get that, no pun intended, but to get that airline off the ground, it was grueling. But Nate had, had begun to show some real signs of growth and a number of my good friends had invested and uh, they were saying things to me like, have you seen this stuff? Uh, do you wear this stuff? This is, this is really great. They loved, they loved the style, they loved the fabric, they loved how, how it washed up. And they were saying to me, not, my boys were not coming to me for money. This was my friend saying, man alive, you, you're in this, right? You, you gotta be in this. And so um, that was that was when uh, I made my first investment back then. Still, you know, I mean, enough money to really help uh, Nate, but not enough to that I would uh, die if I lost it. Right, uh, Nate. In terms of bringing you know private capital like that, right? You know, they take well, a little less than thirty percent stake in the company. What did that allow you to do? What did that allow Roan to do? Right. I mean, you know, looking back, is that was that the right decision? Are you happy with it? And I'm curious, you know, beyond the capital itself, obviously, and, and accelerating the growth of the business, what else did that enable Roan to pursue or to take advantage of in terms of having El Catterton on the cap table? Well, the, you know, they're such an established firm and partner. And I think I had kind of convinced myself that my job was done when they came in to the capital stack. And in reality, you learn very quickly, bringing any capital partner is really a fresh start. It's not, it's, it's not the end of a chapter, um, or certainly not the end of the book. So what the capital allowed us to do was to invest in marketing and invest in particular in performance marketing. At the time, performance marketing was still not fully established and the costs and the uh, the opaqueness of the of the data hadn't shifted yet. So now we're in a period where you have very high acquisition costs in uh, in performance marketing and in, in digital performance marketing, and the data has become more opaque, so it's harder to target. So it allowed us to grow quite quickly during that time, and uh, we put that money straight to work in the marketing. We also were able to invest in systems and people and infrastructure. Even just having them as an investor allowed factory partners and supply chain partners to take us more seriously. So, was it the right decision? I have no idea. I mean, it's you know you don't you don't know until you look back. I'm fairly convinced we would not have made it without a pretty substantial capital partner at the time. Building a clothing company is incredibly expensive unless you're willing to build it really really slowly over the long term. But we had multiple years in those early years where we were growing north of 100 percent and even just keeping up with the inventory buys was incredibly expensive let alone the marketing investment and the team investment so uh and and the thought partnership that we had from catterton as we managed and made those decisions was really critical to us in the early days and i would just add chris uh john owsley who was uh, the partner at catterton l catterton that came uh, a board as a board direct as a, a member of the board of directors when in those early stages i think he was a great contributor to introducing nate to people talking about the industry talking about retail opportunities and so later on as you know when we came in i i, I personally 
uh, with Nate's full support, asked John to stay on the board, and he has. And it, he's just been a great, great help. Yeah, Dave and John had not had any interaction, but when he was on his mission for three years, you know, we, we've had this kind of relationship where we would talk every single day. But when he was in London, he had, I've told him, I said, I think this is the busiest you've ever been in your entire career. We went from talking every day to maybe talking once a month. And, um, and so John became a, a significant mentor to me during that time. And it was so great for me when he came back to be able to introduce them and let them build that relationship. And it's been fun to have both of them around the table as we get to this next stage. Right. So as you guys are alluding to, and as I you know, touched on at the start of the call, really the reason we're talking today is that a little over a year ago, you guys bought out El Catterton, right? Uh, and that I think is, you know, and we'll get into the details of that, which I think is sort of a remarkable story, um, but a, it's a very compelling one, even at a high level, the idea of a family owned business and buying out the private equity investor. That's not something you usually see. Um, first, they wanted to just do a quick, you know, summary of how we get to that point, right? Because I know 2020, a lot of businesses struggling, a lot of founders um, are sleepless nights. They're figuring out how to make payroll. They're figuring out what's the path forward. We have no idea what the next day is going to bring, let alone the next month, the next year. Um, I know you are in a place where you're thinking about, you know, do I even want to still do this anymore? How do you get from there to, you know, a year later thinking through, actually, not only am I so committed to this business, you know, not only am I excited about this business, I'm so committed that I want to try to buy out this private capital giant. Um, and then, you know, once you get to that point, how do you start thinking about the strategy, right? How do you actually do that? Yeah, well, it's a, a, it's a bit of a long story. I'll try and condense it as much as I can. It does start really right at the end of 2020, which was a stressful year for so many. And we were, you know, fortunate that everyone in our company, everyone in our family was safe and healthy, but, uh, and we had had a year of, significant growth. Our, our biggest absolute growth year to date came in 2020. Um, so the brand was growing and evolving, but I was so burned out from every single week. It felt like there was a new crisis, whether it was geopolitically or whether it was supply chain related or personnel related. And again, as I mentioned, you know, my parents were off in London. We couldn't see them. They were dealing with their own set of crises, trying to manage uh, 200 um, people between the ages of 18 and, and 24 and uh, and keep them engaged and occupied during a really difficult time. And so didn't have as much of that outlet to compare notes. And I found myself at the end of 2020 just struggling to decide, I'm not sure that I have the energy to keep doing this. And if I, if I do keep doing this, something really has to change because just emotionally, physically, it was really, it was, it was a moment of just major burnout. And uh, so I, uh, I went to another mentor and friend of mine, um, uh, Brian Rolap, who lives just five minutes from me. I went to him and said, here's where I am. I don't know what I'm gonna do. And he said, well, whenever I'm at a pivotal moment in a career, I give myself a period of time and then I make a decision and I commit to that decision. And I don't allow myself to pick my head up you know, until two to three years have passed. And uh, he said, you're in that moment right now. Give yourself 30 days, research all the options, understand the opportunity, make a decision, and then move forward. And it was great counsel for me. I needed it at that time. And um, I read a lot. I spoke to a lot of people. And what I decided is we have unfinished business, but if we're going to do this, we're going to change the way we're doing a lot of this. One, I'm finally going to really invest in some superb executive talent. At the time, most of our senior team was made up of people that we had started with or hired as, you know, interns and just kind of promoted from within. Um, it was time to go get really strong executive talent. And two, the other thing is I wanted to not look at this as we were one to two years away from an exit uh, because Catterton was kind of on that path to what if we run this for the next 10, 20, 30 years? What would that look like? How do we build this brand for the long term? And so 21, we continued to have significant growth, but we also added three tremendously talented executives. And um, we started to get a lot of inbound interest from additional private equity partners out there who wanted to put significant checks into the business 
you know, upwards of, uh, of 100 million with the intent to then take the company public two years after that. And so we're right at that moment, end of 21, Dave's now back from the mission. We're talking again every day. And I go and I have a conversation with Brian Rollup again. And I say, hey, you were so helpful last year. I just want to tell you where the business is at. We're now growing. We're getting all this inbound interest. And he stops me and he says, so wait a minute. I just want to understand this correctly. You're going to have two private equity firms in the business? And I said, yeah, but you know, it's really the right next path. And we could take the company public. He said, do you think you'll be happier after you do that? And he's just, he's, he's got such a way about asking really thoughtful questions. I said, you know, when you put it that way, you know, probably not. He said, it sounds like you have more conviction than you've ever had in the team and the product and where the company's going. If I were you, I would try and control the business for as long as you can and see if you can buy Catterton out and bring new investors in. So I left and I couldn't stop thinking about that. So the first person I called was my dad. I said, hey, I just had this conversation with Brian. And what do you think about this crazy idea? I have no idea if they will sell. I don't think they'll sell because they're seeing what we're seeing. And he said, we absolutely have to do this. This is, you know, business is on a great track trajectory. We've got to do this. And so we then got to work and we set up a weekly meeting and um and part of the first uh conversation was me taking john uh alzea catterton on a long walk and talking to him about this idea to which he said exactly what we thought he would say is we're not really interested in selling we love the business we love the brand and it took a series of conversations and um a, a global conflict that impacted private equity returns and uh, the market for us to get a deal done. But um, that's how we got to that point. Dave, I'd love to get your side of that story. You know, what, what is that kind of first reaction? What, what are the emotions like when Nate first calls you uh, and says, hey, I've got this crazy idea. What do you think? Well, it was interesting because I had been thinking about what I wanted to do after coming back from three years in London, totally focused on um, supervising 700 people from 54 countries and, and trying to do things to help people, trying to change lives. And it was a great experience, but I was, I was starting to focus on what I wanted to do when I came back. And one of the things I thought that I, it would be great to do would be to work with my sons. I have four sons and I have two daughters and I'm working with my daughter full time on a not full-time, but part-time on a company that she's running full-time. And, uh, and I, I saw the opportunity with Nate to, to invest some way, to, to truly get some skin in the game in a big way. And, and through, you know, especially helping him with things like his board of directors, making sure we have the right industry expertise, making connections uh, for him through the industry that I have been close to for a long time, the sports business and people in that business. And then just knowing what a terrific CEO he is and, um, and then his brother, just a, a great day-to-day -day marketing voice and product manager. He, they're, they're both really good at what, what they, they do. I didn't want a job there. I didn't want to, I didn't think they needed any help other than, as I say, to give them wings to fly, to make sure they had the, the tools, the capital, the structure, you know, everything that they need to succeed. And, and I don't think we're all the way there yet, but we, we took a giant step when we were able to buy out El Catterton. And, and frankly, what I said to John was, I want, I want to work with my sons. And I know that's a personal thing. I know it's it, in many ways, it's making it a family company, but John, that's what I want to do. And, and I, I don't ever approach anybody in private equity for a sale unless I'm prepared and we're prepared to give you a, a return that you can defend to your, to your LPs and, and the people who have invested. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm look, looking for a bargain here. We'll pay 
as a family, but this is what we want to do. And I look, I, I knew that that John then had to face the truth that if he said no completely to that, he would risk, you know, getting Nate's full heart and soul, even though I knew Nate that that wouldn't happen with Nate. I think that he knew Nate wanted the same thing to happen. So over a, a course of six months, we had a number of, of good conversations and we worked together and made it happen. Obviously, a big part of this is raising uh, this special special purpose vehicle, right? And, and raising right. the capital to buy out El Caterton. Um, would love to hear a little bit more, Dave, about your role in that, because you brought together, uh, you and Nate, just a sort of laundry list of heavy hitters from the industry, right? I, I'm looking at the list now, you know, David Blitzer, owner of the 76ers, the Devils, and you know, numerous other teams and assets and sports. Right. Uh, Gabe Plotkin, co-chairman uh, in Charlotte, uh, the Larry Miller's family office, Steve Young, uh, NFL Hall of Famer. Um, what was that process like, right? And, and you know, you kind of hitting the bricks almost, right? And and working the Rolodex that you had developed over decades and decades in the industry. Uh, and I'm curious to hear too, you know, what was the reaction you were getting from these people when you approached them with this uh, idea of, hey, we're trying to, you know, raise this capital and go buy out um, this private equity giant so we can take control of the company back. Do you want me to take that, Nate, or you want to start with that process? You can you can take it. Okay. Well, um, we first of all we brought in a terrific uh, banker uh, group of bankers from Lazard, and we started to look hard at the company and all of the data and and financials, and they became a believer right away that this was something we could do. They were instrumental in developing materials for us to use. And we developed really a great presentation about, about not just Roan, but about our competitors and growth in this industry and why Roan was in a specific special place that really made a lot of sense, dedicated as we were then to, to men's um, active wear, as well as the commuter line, which just hit perfect for what happened with the pandemic. So, so they were helpful. I had a list of people that I wanted to talk to and I just started reaching out. Nate added to that list because um, throughout his time as, as founder and CEO, he had run into people who had said, look, if there's ever a situation where I could invest, I'd be interested. These were people who had tried the product and found that they were wearing it more and more uh, consistently and we're believers in the company. So combination of, of um, people I'd known in the industry, plus uh, Nate's contacts. And many times we both would go see them. Sometimes I would make the first call and, uh, and go see and catch up with people I'd known before and, and the people that you've talked about. I mean, I, I am the one that, that first found Larry Miller to buy the jazz. That was, clear back uh, before both of you were born, but um, it was, it was, uh, it was a great time when the jazz had moved to Salt Lake, I became president and I needed capital. And uh, Larry Miller was a Toyota dealer in the, in the South part of Salt Lake city. He owned two dealerships. Somehow we got the local bank to lend him $8 million to buy half of the Utah jazz. And that paid off debt and gave me working capital. And we got lucky in the draft and we were off to the races. So the, the Miller family, unfortunately, Larry is gone, but the Miller family has been great stewards of the jazz and they sold the jazz uh, for a substantial amount, 1.7 billion. They then sold their dealerships. So they were sitting on a lot of cash. And um, I went to them about Rome and they, they invested and now I'm helping them with their efforts to get a major league baseball team in Salt Lake City. So, so it's these relationships over time have been one of the best parts of my life. And, and I'm really thrilled to have such great partners with us in, in Rome. Obviously, you guys have a great partnership between you two. And we had a great question in the chat, and I would love to hear both of you answer it, which is sort of, you know, what is the best part and the worst part of having a working father-son relationship? Yeah. 
I don't, I mean, honestly, there, maybe I'm, I'm still in a, a honeymoon period, but there hasn't been a worse part. I mean, I've been uh, so fortunate to, to grow up and we, we were always doing things together uh, and, um, and various projects and my parent for my parents service has been really important. So whether it's engaging in service projects or, you know, I would bring everything to my parents. And I've always said to people, uh, because no matter, no matter what I accomplish in life, um, you know, when you have a, when you have parents who are known, the first thing that you will hear is, oh, well, he only did this because his, you know, his parents are such and such. And what I, uh, and when I was younger, when I was in my early twenties, I would be like, this is so frustrating. I don't understand why, you know, it doesn't matter. And then I realized, wait a minute, they're a hundred percent right. I wouldn't have the opportunities that I have without the success of my parents. The only piece that people get wrong is they don't give my mom enough credit because she's every part is equal and, um, and an incredible, uh, mother. So, you know, for me, I've been so fortunate to have their leadership and guidance and there's only been a best part for me. So to be able to call them and reach out and, um, trying to convince my my dad to come spend some time in the offices every once in a while uh but that it's only been really special um you know if there is a worst part it's probably just that you know i feel a significant amount of pressure to make them proud and to uh you know to do right by them and you know to to live the value system that they taught me but i also feel like that's a benefit so i you know that's probably how i would answer that question so, Chris, first of all, I want to congratulate Nate for making his bed uh, before this podcast this morning. Wait, I forgot. This is, this is the worst part, right? Showing here. <laughs> that, that his mother actually taught him something. So among Actually, she taught him many things. Um, but no, th- th- we've had a great time. But there is, there is a bit of a downside here. Nate has built this company that has a, a great message uh, you know, it's about taking good care of your body, of getting appropriate exercise, working out. The gear that they make is the best stuff to work out in. And and I do work out. But when, when I go to his house, um, we have to get involved in a workout and then jump into a, a sauna and then, then get in a, an ice cold bath. And I'm, you know, <laughs> look, it's, I understand it's good for mental health. I absolutely support the mission, but do we have to do that? <laughs> you know, so, so the worst part for he, you is the cold plunge. And, and he even actually asked me to go in the middle of the winter over to the Connecticut Sound and jump in there when the water, you know, the water's got to be in the, 20s or 30s so. no no in the thir- high 30s but uh to his credit he's done it so well the, and you know what physically it's been great as i have uh, as everyone does age it's been great for me i love the culture of this company they 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 involve their customers in workouts in the stores they talk about mental health Nate's doing something very special that he can talk about if he wants uh, around a, an upcoming football game. This this is an issue in our society, and Nate's passionate about it, and uh, I think it's a really worthy thing that he's doing. I think it's a perfect segue, you know, kind of the last few questions as we look to start wrapping this up. Um, you know, big one, obviously, is, is what's next for Roan, right? And I know, you know, the plan is a women's line coming next year. Um, and Nate would love to hear, you know, some thoughts there, because obviously your success to this point was finding that niche, right, of this is a men's premium sportswear market that has been neglected. To now start branching beyond that space, right, what, le- what leads you to that? What are your early thoughts? Um, and, you know, and beyond that, what else, you know, do you have in mind next, say, three years, five years for Roan? What should be uh, looking for around the company? Yeah, I think that ties directly back to the freedom that, we feel now in this new new phase of business and again it's not that caterton was ever restrictive but when you're kind of controlling the destiny you might be a little bit more adventurous and take more risk um, than when you're looking at it as protecting an investment and so we knew and from the beginning we've had people ask for a women's line 
we have access to really unique fabrications. We have exclusivities on some of the fabrics that we've developed over time with some of the best mills in the world, Italian, Japanese, uh, Taiwanese mills. And uh, it's a great opportunity for us to bring this unique fabric technology and, and fabrication to the market in, um, you know, in a market that is not at all underserved, but we can bring it in a unique way and a unique approach. Um, what's next for us is to continue to take chances, to dare to be great in our category and to be disruptive. And uh, we're not going to get there with complacency. One of the um, top 10 nego non-negotiables that Nike had in the early days, which I think we subscribe to completely, is you are on offense all the time. And that's how we view the world. We're opening um, a lot of retail stores. We've opened 11 in the last 12 months. Um, the business is now growing at nearly twice the rate it was uh, uh, the year before we did the transaction and um, on a bigger base. And we'll have our highest absolute growth year in 2023. So it's about leaning in, continuing to grow, continuing to invest in good people, good markets, and um, continuing to innovate with our product quality. And I think that is really important. And then, as my dad mentioned, the, the the issue that is at the foundation and has been from the beginning for us is focusing on mental health and what we sometimes call mental fitness. The idea that you need to take care of your mind as much as you as now people take care of their body. We have lots of tools for measuring um, our fitness performance and and encouraging us to take steps, but we need to start develop some tools to take care of our uh, our mental health and give ourselves mental therapy when we um, when we need it just as much as we do physical therapy. So uh, we're developing an advisory board in that space. We're developing some unique approaches there, and we have some really, really powerful partnerships that we'll start introducing in 2024 uh, to further that mission. Yeah. Before I hand things off, I'll hand it off to Dan to, to wrap us up here. One last question for both of you. Um, you know, and we had a question in, in the chat about skims, and you know, Nate, you were just talking about how you know you're in a more crowded space now, right? And so I'm just curious how you guys look at the landscape broadly and whether that's even beyond um you know kind of retail clothing uh, and athletic wear how do you guys view that landscape today how do you view it moving forward i think you know a lot of people in the chat a lot of our readers are interested in right how do you approach this landscape now right where we're you know potentially teetering on the edge of a recession um you know do we need to be concerned about the state of the economy you know how are you guys approaching it as business leaders um and, and i guess what are your thoughts looking ahead in kind of that macro sense yeah, well, I'll, I'll try and take those in turn. Uh, the partnership that Skims launched with the NBA, I think is a really exciting one for them um, in shapewear specifically. Um, they have done a great job of building that business uh, off of Kim's face, but not having it be entirely about her and the way that they've appealed and the way they market. And they've done a good job in terms of um, body inclusivity. And um, so just some real thought leaders, I, I take my hat off to them. And you're seeing it in the valuation framework that they're being approached with uh, as, as one of these really incredible brands that have emerged in the space. Macroeconomically, I think it's a challenging time. You know, not only, I'm not a geopolitical expert, but not only do we have these two massive conflicts that are happening in the world, you know, we've had um, rising interest rates over the last several years after, you know, significant inflation, that has impacted the consumer. It started with consumers that um, would be more entry-level household incomes because everything was impacting share of wallet. Um, we're now starting to see it creep into other parts of the economy. Um, thankfully for us, we have, you know, we've been able to continue to grow despite some of the challenges. And I think the American consumer has remained um, incredibly resilient through some of these challenges. But we're, you know, so we're cautiously optimistic. But again, that's part of we don't look at this as a business that we're going to make a massive change with in the next one to two years. We're really trying to build this in the long term. So the way that we buy our inventory, the way that we invest in markets is really for the long term versus looking at it as a, a short term opportunity to boost margin or to boost um, top line growth. Dave, I'll give you the last word, same subject. You know, do you have concerns? Right. Do you see opportunity? What's your read on the years to come? Look, I, there's there's reasons to be concerned, but there's always been reasons to be concerned. And uh, the con this conflict seems particularly difficult to resolve, but that conflict's always been there. So I'm, I, I believe that the future gets built by the people who believe in the future and, and who take risks 
appropriate risks and get themselves in a position to uh, to succeed. I think Rome has 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 built uh, their relationships, especially the manufacturing relationships, in a very smart way. They're important to their to their manufacturers. They get great support. They have great uh, design people and business people all through the organization now. It's a company that will be a part of the future. And I, I'm, I'm excited to, to support Nate in that. As far as sports goes though, wow. I mean, what's happening to prices around the world for franchises, both in Europe and in the US is really stunning. The Washington Commanders are just the latest example, 6 billion. You know, the Man United is being valued at six to seven billion. Um, these these prices are stunning. And I keep thinking there's nobody left that could actually do this. And then somebody else comes forward. But what's happening in streaming in the U.S. is is a big place to watch now and a big opportunity with the with the regional networks literally falling apart and and the whole broadcast model changing, perhaps the NBA packaging all their rights to a to a big tech company in the future and and generating even more uh, income to share with their players. Those those trends are what I'm really curious about and and uh, looking to help and advise people in my own industry about what to do. So, you know, I I I think there's all kinds of opportunities for the future and and I'm I'm quite optimistic about uh, Ron's place in it. And what a great discussion. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. To the audience, thank you so much for being here. I'll give a quick plug to uh, more of this if you want it. November 29th and 30th, we'll be in D.C. for Sports Business Journal's Dealmakers Conference. Josh Harris will be there. Dave, that was a great tee up for that. Kevin Mayer uh, will be there to talk about the media space. Ted Leonsis, Andre Guadala, Sheila Johnson, Melody Hobson, tons of people who are heavily focused on the sports ecosystem, the financial ecosystem and investing in sports. So would love to see folks there. There will be a link dropped in the chat and then it'll be in your follow-up email as well. Um, Dave, Nate, thank you so much for your time. A round of applause for you. Chris, thanks for being a great moderator. We really appreciate it. We'll see everyone next time. Have a great day. Thanks so, thanks much, so much. Take care.